So my relationship with the Lord began when I was in 10th grade. And now I'm sitting here, I can reflect. And I realize the Lord had a story for me before I was born. Looking at my past and early friendships, I am allowed to be connected to some really defined human beings who are orchestrating my baptism. So from 10th grade and on, I gave my life away and he came swarming in. Of course, you know, bad things or unpleasant things still occur, but you grow and you evolve and you learn you allow him to teach you and guide you through life. Whatever your fingerprint is, whatever your purpose is, he will help you find it. So I'm just grateful to be surrounded by these beautiful human beings. And um, I'm excited for what's to come next. Hey, what's going on, One Shot family and friends? This is Rodney here, man. It's so good to be back with you guys. I know I've been gone for a few weeks, uh, man, but this series has been awesome that we've been in called Why Church. And we've had Pastor Shun and and uh, and, and Darius and Sunny bring some powerful messages uh, as we've been exploring the question of why church? What is the church? Why is the church necessary? Why is uh, Jesus so emphatic about us belonging to the church or, or being a part of community, stirring up one another, as we heard last week, to good works. And so uh, I, I pray that you guys would just really take this series to heart and, and, and know for yourself uh, the importance of church, because the days that we're heading in, um, Jesus said that these days would be darker. Uh, Paul said that these days would be uh, dark as well. And so as we move forward into darker days, I think that the church will only shine brighter and the church will only reveal itself to be uh, more of a necessary component to our lives. Well, um, I think I'm going to cap this series off. And uh, the title of this message today is called Church Hypocrite church hypocrite yep i can already tell y'all are like okay where are we going with this all right but before we jump into this sermon why don't you guys pray with your boy jesus i thank you uh for your grace for your mercy i thank you lord for the opportunity uh to preach and to proclaim the good news of jesus christ to your people holy spirit i pray that you use this moment that you use me uh, my personality my mind my heart my soul everything that pertains to me to communicate the goodness of Jesus Christ. And I pray that at the end of this message, our minds and our hearts will be focused on Jesus. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. If you agree with your boy, somebody say amen. How many of you guys enjoy the art of acting? The art of acting. Um, there was a moment in my life, a season in my life, where, where I was confronted with like some deep, deep-seated insecurities, man. Um, I actually lived in Canada. I went to school in Canada in 2006 to 2008. And uh, at the school, they had uh, this, this, this theater project. And your boy is, uh, uh, needless to say, from the hood, right? We, we don't do a bunch of acting other, other than, you know, acting, you know, trying to be hard out here in these streets, cuz, right? But aside of that, I mean, I, I don't do any acting. I, and I definitely don't do singing and dancing and all of that. Well, we had an opportunity to uh, be a part of this theater. And so I had my heart set on being the backstage crew. Hey, I can move some things and I can do the mics and all that, let me do that. And uh, the, the director of the, of, the, of the play, she insisted that I participated in acting in this thing. And I'm like, no, 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 I can do this. You know, I can, I can be behind the scenes and I can, and she said, no, no, you're gonna do it. And I was like, and I couldn't argue with the lady. I really couldn't, man. And, and uh, I was terrified. So 
To this day, I've been mocked. I've been made fun of for my participation in this in this theater play. And uh, they had me uh, as an angel. I was I think I was a Roman soldier or something. And I was an angel. And I had this I had a few lines that I had to spit. And I was just like, bro. Now they wanted me to sing and they, and they and they wanted me to dance. And I said, no, I'm not dancing. That's when I put my foot down. Y'all know. Right. I put my I put my foot down. Uh, needless to say. But uh, the reason why I bring that up is because as we talk about this tension, as we talk about this question, uh, why church? One of the things that I've heard out of my 15 years of being around the church is this. The church are full of a bunch of fill in the blank. Hypocrites, right? That's one of the main things that you hear. The church is full of a bunch of of hypocrites. And the interesting thing is this, Jesus has a lot to say. Jesus has the most to say actually about hypocrites and 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 being hypocritical. Here's uh what Jesus has to say uh directly to hypocrites. He says, "Don't give like hypocrites." He says, "Don't pray like hypocrites." He says, "Don't fast like hypocrites." And he says, "Don't judge like hypocrites." Jesus uh, surprisingly would probably agree with you, right? Now, as we talk about this, this, this whole, uh, the church is full of hypocrites and this is why I don't necessarily value the church or this is why I don't necessarily go to church. The church is full of hypocrites. I would, I would ask you to proceed with caution because just maybe, just maybe as we point the finger at others for being hypocritical, could it possibly be that we ourselves are some of the biggest hypocrites. And there's a passage of scripture that 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 is just going to really expose the church and even expose uh, one of the biggest leaders that was in the church at this time. And uh, my goal at the end of this sermon is that you would find great security and confidence in being your authentic self in Christ Jesus. Now, before we jump into the passage of scripture, we have to identify, we have to, we have to break down and define what this word hypocrite means, right? And in the Greek, this word hypocrites, the, the, the actual word used in the New Testament, uh, is the Greek word hypocrites, right? Check that out. Hupo, hypocrites. There's, there it is. Hypocrites. And this is what it means. Check this out. It means like a performer acting under a mask, a theater actor. Right. It says figuratively a two faced person. How many of you guys have heard that? Oh, she's two faced or he's two faced. Right. It says that someone who says one thing but does another. Now, check this one out. I love this is a bar. It says one whose profession One whose profession, what they speak, what they proclaim does not match, does not equal to their practice. One whose profession does not match their practice. Right. This was a word commonly used for for Greek, ancient Greek actors on stage. Now, as Jesus uses this word quite often, this is all of the emotion. This is all of the of the things that he's trying to describe. He's saying that there's something that is off about you. There is something that is off about what you proclaim to be versus what you practice versus your behavior and what you produce. OK, and so uh, let's jump on to Galatians chapter two and we're going to read verses 11 through 15. And I really believe that we're all going to be challenged. And I really believe that we're all going to be encouraged at the end of this talk. All right. Galatians chapter two, verses 11 through 15. And it says this. But when Cephas or Peter, the apostle Peter, came to Antioch, this is the apostle Paul writing to the church of Galatia. And he's writing about an instant. He's writing about a, 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 a circumstance that took place between him and the apostle Peter. And there's so much for us to learn from this from this passage or from this encounter. It says, but when Peter came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face. Paul says, I stepped to him, stepped up on him, pulled up on Peter 
and I opposed him to his face. Here's why. Because he stood condemned. What do you mean, Paul? And he says, for before certain men came from James. James is the half brother of Jesus, who was known to be a very devout, credible Jew, who was actually known to become or he was he was on his way to becoming a part of the Pharisaical ranks. So this James, who was surrounded by all of these uh, 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 very religious, astute Jewish men, it says that uh, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. He was eating with the non-Jews, the people who didn't keep the Ten Commandments or 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 I shouldn't say the Ten Commandments or they didn't live according to the to the Jewish law. These were non-Jewish people. And it says, but when James and his boys came, it says that Peter drew back and separated himself. So why did he draw back and why did he separate himself? And here's what it says. He was afraid. He was fearing the circumcision party. And it says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically. There's our word along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Now, let me let me stop there. You have. The Apostle Peter, the person who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, ate with Jesus, traveled with Jesus, saw Jesus heal, saw Jesus even raise the dead. You have this apostle struggling with his identity. He's struggling with his profession matching his practice. He finds himself eating with non-Jewish people, which was according to the Jewish law, which was unacceptable. You were not to enter into the home of a Gentile, let alone share or break bread with a Gentile, which is a non-Jewish person. You were considered unclean if you were to eat or, or, or fellowship with non-Jewish people in this time. And so it says that these certain men, and usually when the Bible says certain men, it, it means that there's, that there's ambiguity as it pertains to their faith in Christ. Usually when the Bible is speaking about believers, it will directly say believers or it will directly say disciple. So probably these men were not followers of Jesus, but yet they had this Jewish prestige. They had this Jewish influence and authority. And Peter was filled with fear because Peter was conflicted for a moment. There was a part of him that knew the truth, but there was a part of him that was afraid to embrace that truth. His profession didn't match his practice. And it says that he acted hypocritically. And here's the deal. He acted hypocritically, and it wasn't just him, but it was all those who followed him. It says even Barnabas. Barnabas, who was very instrumental into introducing the Apostle Paul to the Christian community, it says that even Barnabas was led astray by this hypocrisy, right? So let's keep reading. Then it says, Paul says, but when I saw, when I saw that their conduct, that their behavior, that their practice was not in step with the truth of the gospel. This is why it's so important for us to even understand what the gospel is, because Paul is saying, hey, Peter, your practice, Peter, your conduct is not in step with the gospel. Something's off here, Peter. And then he says, I said to Peter before all of them, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? He's saying, hold on, Peter, wait a minute, time out. If you being a Jew, don't live like a Jew, but rather you live like a Gentile. How can you now come along and force Gentile people to live like Jews? Now, I want to pick this this passage of scripture up in the message version. This is uh, Eugene Peterson's commentary, and it's powerful. And I really think in this simple and plain language, it's going to bring out more and more of what we should consider in this passage. Paul goes on, man, and Paul goes on to deliver a gospel field response and correction to Peter's hypocrisy and the church's hypocrisy. Paul goes on to say this. He says, we Jews know that we have no advantage of birth, of birth over non-Jewish sinners. 
It means that just because we were born Jewish doesn't make us better than the Gentiles. He says, we know very well that we are not set right with God by rule keeping, but only, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says we're not made right with God because of our ability to keep rules. We're not made right with God because of our birth or, or our pedigree. But he says we're only made right with God. We're only accepted by God through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, how do we know? He says, we tried it. How do we know we're not made right with God through rule keeping? We've already tried it, guys. And he says, and we had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. We were convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement. Hold up. Wait a minute, Paul. Paul says that we cannot be accepted by God through or we cannot please God through our self improvement and a whole world is full of this if you look at the uh, best-selling books out here much of it has to do with self-help much of it has to do with improving the self and and you having the ability to improve or better yourself and Paul says it's impossible Peter why are you afraid of this truth that Jesus has spoken and declared over you why are you drawing back why are you separating why are you acting hypocritically? He goes on. He says, we believe in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah, not by trying to be good. Could it be that most of the time when we find ourselves acting hypocritically, it's because we're not confident, we're not secure in who we really are. And so therefore, we feel as though we need to put on this mask. We need to put on this, this charade. We need to put on this acting job to get people to believe in a person that doesn't really exist. And this is where so many believers struggle. This is where so many churches struggle. We do feel as though we need to come into the church or we need to be a part of a community and we need to, to, to personify an image that doesn't really exist. And here's how empty that will leave you is because if, if we walk around with our mask on and we walk around with this personification of this person that we, that we hope or that we wish existed and the people will fall in love with that person, but is that person who you are? Is that person who you really are? And the answer to that question is no. So now we have people loving us for who we are really not. And that is so damaging to the soul. But Paul is saying is God will accept you. God does love you on the basis of your trust and confidence, not in yourself, not in your ability, but in him. Wow. Paul goes on to say, he says, has some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? Hey, is it, is, it, is it any news to you guys that we're imperfect, right? We are not perfect. He says, no great surprise, right? And are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me and you who go through Christ in order to get things right with God aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin. He's saying, if, if you and I who go through Christ to be made right with God, if we are not perfect, does it mean that somehow Christ is used or Christ is, is an accessory to our sinfulness? And Paul says, absolutely not. Just because you and I are imperfect doesn't mean that he isn't. Just because that, that, that you and I are not perfect doesn't mean that Jesus isn't. Man, this is good. Then he says, the accusation is frivolous. <laughs> it's empty, right? He says, if I was trying to be good, if I was actually trying to be good, I would be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down. I would be acting as a charlatan. 
What Paul is saying is, guys, I'm done with trying to be good. I'm done with trying to to have everyone have this good opinion about me. Because Paul is saying and what he's going to say in this next uh, body of scripture is just going to man. If you if you meditate on Galatians chapter two, it will provide you with so much freedom because our culture is full of actors. Our culture is full of people who wear masks. We put our mask on on Instagram. We put our mask on on Facebook. We got to put our mask on when we go to work. We put our mask on so many different occasions. We're wearing a mask, but behind that smile, behind the veneer is the real you. And, and, and is that you free? Is that part of who you are? Are you free? Is that, part of, is that part of who you are? Are you healthy? And the truth is the church should be the freest place that you can find yourself. The body of Christ should be the most free place that we can find ourselves. Let me, let me go on and because I'm going to answer that. I'm going, I'm going to prove that point. He goes on to say, what actually took place is this. Paul says, I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. Hey, man, I tried doing all of the things in my strength, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. He says, Christ's life showed me how. So many of us, what does he mean, I quit being a lawman? What he's saying is, I quit endeavoring to please God and to please all these other people through my own willpower, strength and discipline. Paul says at the end of that uh, road is emptiness and truly devastation. But there's something liberating about trusting Jesus. There's something liberating about turning from self and turning to the Savior, to the Son of God. And our culture is full of people pointing you back to you. And when we look at us and we're uncomfortable with us, when we are uncomfortable with the person that's looking at us in the mirror, what do we do? We reach immediately for the for the first mask that we can grab and we put it on and we begin to act. Some of us deserve Oscars for how good that we act. But Jesus is saying, I'm not. I'm not saving the person that you pretend to be. I'm saving the person that you really are. I am going to provide a new way for you to be made right with me. I'm going to provide such a secure state of being for you that no other opinion will matter except for mine. Mind blown. So he goes on to say, He says, so I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. Christ doesn't just show us how. Christ doesn't just show us a righteous life, but Christ enables us to live his righteous life. Paul says this. Here's how. He says, I identified myself completely with him. Paul says, I put down the mask. I put down the charades. I stopped pretending and I stopped acting and I completely identified myself with Jesus. And he says, indeed, I have been, past tense, I have been crucified with Christ. Oh, check this out. Check this out. My ego is no longer central. Paul is saying, That when Jesus died on that cross, when he hung on that bloody cross over 2,000 years ago, Paul said that Jesus died as me and he died for me. That you need to see yourself. You need to see the, the, the part of you that you are most ashamed about. We all have things about our past and things that we've done or things that were even done to us. We all have these these parts of us that we're completely ashamed and we're afraid to let them be revealed. We're afraid to be vulnerable. 
But Paul is saying is when you identify with Jesus completely, you that means that you identify you identify with his death for you and as you on the cross. What do I mean as you? What I mean is, yes, we all can nod our head. Jesus did that for us. But what we fail to realize is that Jesus died as you. It means that his death was your death. When he died upon that cross as a spiritual criminal, the wrath of God inflicted his soul and his body like nothing that, that, that humanity has ever seen. He drank the, the wrathful cup of God. And guess what and who it was intended for? You and me. And Paul says, when I identify myself completely with him, I see myself dying as Jesus died. Now, here's the blessedness. Here's the here's the good news that when Jesus rose victoriously without our sins, when he rose without any uh, 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 spot of our sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter six, we rose to newness of life with him. If I'm identified with Jesus in his death, then I must be identified with Jesus in his resurrection. Can I get an amen right there, somebody? That's good. He says this, indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear, that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God. Paul says, listen, when you understand this, you are now on the beginning of a journey of being free. You no longer have to be a slave to the opinions of other people. You no longer have to be a slave to to be to trying to impress God because you know that there is nothing you can produce that impresses God. The only thing that impresses God is the obedience of his son, Jesus. Wow, that is good. And when my faith is in Jesus, when my faith is in his obedience, God says, I am so pleased with you. Come on, let me ask you a question. What can you do that can top what Jesus has done? L what can you do that can top what Jesus has done? There is no amount of obedience. There is no amount of good works. There is no amount of anything that you or I can produce that can top what Jesus has done for you. So here's my, here's, here's my question. Why not trust in that? Why not be free in that? Why not revel in the fact that Jesus is so amazing and he is your great representative? That's why Paul says, I am freely identifying myself completely with Jesus. Oh, can somebody say thank you, Jesus? Man, this is good. Now he goes on to say, he says, I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ, hallelujah. Listen, Christ lives where? in me. Christ lives in me. And he says, the life you see me living now is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Man, I love those scriptures. I just love that. Paul is saying, listen, I died. And the person that was a slave to the opinions of other people, the person that was a slave to to try to impress God. And the only means I had was myself. Paul is saying that individual is deceased. And the person that lives before you today is a person that finds his faith or her faith in Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus alone. And now the joy of Jesus Come on, somebody. Now the peace of Jesus. Now the patience of Jesus. Now the love of Jesus. Now the long suffering of Jesus. Now the gentleness of Jesus can flow through you. And it's not anything that you coerce. It's not that anything you you work out of yourself. It is his nature and life flowing through you. Man, that'll that'll set you free. That'll set you free. Let me keep going. And he says this, I'm not going to go back on that. 
Paul is saying, now that I've stepped into this freedom, I'm not going back. Now that I've taken off my mask, now that I'm free from having to pretend and act and appear, he says, I'm not going back to that. And he says, is it not clear to you that to go back to that old rule keeping, peer pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God? Paul says that when we go back to being a slave to the opinions of people, we abandon something greatly precious in our lives. And he goes on to say exactly what that, what that thing is. He says, I refuse to do that, to repudiate, listen, God's grace or to nullify, to make void God's grace. That means that there is a grace that is provided for you when your faith and your confidence is in Jesus. A grace, a grace that says, I accept you for who you are. Paul says this in Romans chapter five. He says that for while in the midst, in the middle, while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for you. And why did he die for you? Because he loved you. So that means that, hold on, wait a minute. My acceptance in the presence of God isn't on the base, on the basis of my condition. No, your acceptance in the presence of God is solely on the basis of your confidence and your faith in Jesus, period. Now we can take the mask off because who opinion matters more? Culture, people who put their pants on like you, people who get diarrhea. Yeah, I said diarrhea because you, can you imagine Beyonce or Drake or, 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 you know, just these, some of these people, these famous people, right? They're just on the toilet struggling, like going through it, right? Yeah, they're human, just like you. They bleed just like you. So, so why would I be a slave to the opinions of people who are human like me, frail like me, can be easily broken like me, can be weak like me? Why would I, why would I enslave myself to their opinions? But check this out. When the most powerful, beautiful, majestic, glorious being whose name is Yahweh, whose name is Jesus. Oh, man, John says he saw Jesus and he and he shone brighter than the sun. Brighter than the sun. His voice was like the sound of many waters. This is the one who has a good opinion of you because of what he's done for you. I could just be done right there, man. It's just good news, right? Good news. All right. Let me find my place and let's, let's get back, right? Now he says this. He says, I refuse to do that to repudiate or nullify God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. He's saying that if we, if there was another way to be made right with God, then Jesus died unnecessarily. But Jesus told us there is no other way. When Philip said, show us the way, Lord, uh, show, no, Thomas, he said, show us the way. Where are you going? And Jesus said, I am John 14, six. I am the and only way, <laughs> the truth and the life. Right. And here's uh, a few points that I want to give you guys is this. One of the reasons why we wear the mask. One of the reasons why many of us right now, under the sound of my voice, we have a mask on. One of the reasons why is because of fear, fear. And really fear is just uh, 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 the surface of a lack of faith. Many of us have a lack of faith in Jesus. And because we have a lack of faith in Jesus, it kind of gives birth to fear. We're afraid. We're afraid to be free. We're afraid to be who we really are. Pastors are, are just notorious for this doubt and this, and this lack of faith. Because so many people put these expectations on church leaders that, hey, you're supposed to be like this. Your marriage is supposed to be like this. Your children and, and your personal life and your prayer life. And these pastors are afraid to be weak. They're afraid to take the mask off, which is why I think a good leader has to fight to, in every circumstance, not to pick that mask up. As Paul said, not to go back, but to remain free and to remain knowledgeable and to identify yourself completely with Christ. Here's a point I want to give you. It is the faithful love of God 
that produces true freedom. It is the faithful love of God that can only produce true freedom. When you understand that you are loved and accepted on the grounds of Christ love and Christ obedience and Christ righteousness, my God, now you can live in true freedom. Now you can take your mask off, right? And here's the deal. The church, you know, people, when people say the church is full of hypocrites, I want you to think about your life. And I want you to think about in everything that we just read, looking at Peter, one of the greatest apostles, Peter, the, 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 the story has it. Scholars believe it to be that Peter was crucified under the authority of Nero, the, the, the Roman emperor, and that he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified right side up like his Lord and Savior Jesus. Wow. But yet even Peter struggled with hypocrisy. So I, I, I want to I wanna, you know, let you in on something. Sure, the church is full of hypocrites. And guess what? You are one of them. And if you don't see yourself as a hypocrite, then you are probably one of the biggest hypocrites. And I know that's strong, but it's the truth. Our job is not to walk around pointing out who the hypocrites are. Generally, the people who scream hypocrite, 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 they are the biggest hypocrites, which is why Jesus, almost every time he referred to the word hypocrite, he was actually speaking to religious leaders. Because could it be that if our confidence isn't in Jesus, there's something free about knowing, hey, I'm not enough, but Jesus is. And when our confidence is in him, the mask can come off. I don't have to pretend. Whose opinion matters more, yours or Jesus? Find freedom in that. Find freedom in that. Let me go on and we're going to read. Uh, let me give you another point real quick. The gospel is what helped Peter to remove his mask. This is why One Shot Church, man, we emphasize belief so much. It is our vision that you can believe. Why is belief so important? It's because the gospel is what inspired and sparked Peter's belief again. And when Peter found the right way to believe, he found the right way to behave. We find that in church, many times pastors and church leaders and teachers emphasize behavior, 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 and they emphasize self, 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 self. My thing is this, if we emphasize belief, if we emphasize the Savior, then guess what will follow? Your behavior, your practice. If you believe right, you'll, you'll behave right. It's the truth. And this is what we, we, we found too, is when you believe properly, you can actually belong properly. Belong. We want to be a church where you can belong. That doesn't mean that every one of our belief systems has to be perfectly 100% lined up, but it does mean that we find belonging and unity under the umbrella of who Jesus is. And we believe that if we can be a community where you can believe, belong, then guess what happens next? You become. And you never stop becoming on this side of glory. You never stop becoming. There's always room for growth and evolution. And we believe that we're a community where we can take our mask off. We don't have to pretend we are somewhere when we're really not. We are all on a journey. But the beautiful thing about it is we're journeying together with our mask off. We're not all pretending and waving and smiling, but underneath the mask, we're crying, we're devastated, we're jealous, we're envious. Come on, somebody, let me hurry up. So the gospel is what helped Peter to remove the mask, the hypocrisy. And here's a point that I want to give you. A healthy church hinders hypocrisy. A healthy church hinders hypocrisy. I want it to be difficult for people to wear a mask in our community. I don't want it to be easy. I don't want us to be a church where you look good and you smell good and you smile good and everybody thinks that you're good. I want, I want you to feel so uncomfortable wearing that mask. You know how we have our mask on today because it's COVID, right? And you just get that like stale breath. Oh, you go, G God, gr free me from this mask, right? My breath. I want that. To, I want you to feel the same way. I want you to feel so uncomfortable under that mask that you just go, oh, geez, I got to take this off. And everybody goes, hey, how, how, how are you really doing? I see you. 
And guess what? I'm not afraid of you. I, I, I'm not run off by you because, hey, look at me. I have my issues. I have my opportunities to trust Jesus. I have my opportunities to grow. Hey, let's grow together. This is what's up. This is community. This is what the church should be. We should hinder hypocrisy, not help further hypocrisy. Right. All right. Let me go on. Ephesians chapter four, verses 22. Let me hurry up. Paul continues on to the church of Ephesus. And this is what he says. Paul says, put off your old self, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. And he says, and it is corrupt through deceitful desires. Paul says this. When we keep putting on the mask of the person we used to be, or when we keep putting on the mask of our old self, he says that here's the danger. Your old self is corrupt and it has deceitful desires. Could it be that the desires you have are not really the desires you should have? Could it be that the desires you have are actually desires connected to your old self, to the old mask, right? And this is what Paul goes on to say. And he says, but we, we are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And he says, and to put on the new self, which is what? Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Hold on. Wait a minute. Paul says, take off the old mask. Take off the old self. Put on the new self, which is what created in the exact likeness of God. That is a blessing. And then he says, how in true righteousness, in true justice. This is who you really are now. Then he says, and holiness, meaning that there is something pure. There is something set apart about your new self. Embrace it. Wear it. Stand confidently in this new self, understanding that you may have some struggles. You may have some some areas of weakness, but you are made in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And God is accepted with you. You are acceptable to God. Man. Then he goes on to say, he says, therefore, having put away falsehood, having put away the lies, the deception, the mask, right? He says, let each one of you speak the truth. How can we speak the truth if we're all lying to each other? How can we speak the truth when I ask you, how are you doing? And you say, I'm good, but really you are depressed. Really, you may even be co contemplating suicide. That is falsehood. And Paul says in the church, falsehood shouldn't exist. We should be fighting against falsehood. We should be fostering an environment of freedom. And he says, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we, check this out, we are members of one another. Paul says the reason why we can't go on pretending and faking and acting is because we are members of one another. And as the church, why church? We are members of one another. And why is, uh, I don't go to church because there's too many hypocrites. Why that's not a good excuse is because you are one and you struggle with it just like the people you are pointing your finger at. But the only thing that saves us all, come on somebody, the only one that saves us all from that mask with deceitful desires it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Here's a point or question that I want to bring up again is does your profession match your practice? Is what you are proclaiming, is what you are saying, does it match your practice? And I want to finish with this verse. Ephesians chapter five, verses one through two. There's anybody we should be imitating. If there's anybody we should be pretending to be like is, 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 is what Paul is going to say right here. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. One of the highlights of my life was I was at Chipotle. My wife was in San Diego and I was at uh, actually, no, my wife was my wife was here and we were getting something to eat. And uh, my kids were in the car 
And as I came back in the car, my kids were singing out loud this, 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 this Christian song of praise. And man, I just went, y'all know me, anybody that knows me, but it's just like, I just wanted to say, thank you, Jesus. Like that was a proud moment. And you know why my children were singing like as robustly as they were? It's because they see daddy doing it almost every day. They hear the Maverick City and all of the, 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 the worship being played in the household. They see daddy singing, they see daddy worship. And guess who they're imitating? They're imitating their father. They're imitating their father. And I was reminded of the scripture where it says, out of the mouth of babes, thou has ordained praise. Out of the mouth of children, you have ordained praise. And my, my babies could be singing a lot of songs. It breaks my heart when I hear these, song, these kids singing these ratchet, trifling songs. But to hear my children singing the most purest praise to Jesus, come on somebody, you can't imagine. Your boy was, your boy was excited. Paul says this, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave up, gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So here's the bottom line, church. Here's the bottom line. Hypocrisy is a real challenge for all of us. As we've seen, it was a challenge for the apostle Peter. And uh, I want to encourage you. Don't, you know, to say I don't go to church or I don't participate in church because they're full of hypocrites. I'm telling you, when you say that, you're pointing the finger at yourself. Sure, the church is full of people who are struggling with insecurities people are struggling with uh fear people are struggling with doubt and this is the church is the safest place to work that out it should be the safest place to work that out so guys i want to encourage you take your mask off take your mask on put on your new self which is created this is the part of you that you can be confident in created in the likeness of god and true righteousness and holiness you are pleased you are accepted by god on the basis of what jesus has done not what you have done so let your profession, let your profession match your practice. Ah, I pray that as we discuss this in our groups, man, that this would create some good, good dialogue for you guys. And I believe that it would lead to just greater freedom in your life, man. The gospel truly does work if you work it, if you trust it, if you rest in it, right? If you meditate in it. Let me pray for you and let me get out the way. Jesus, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. I pray that, God, what I spoke today would encourage the souls and the hearts of your children. I pray that, Lord, our minds and our hearts would be more focused and centered on you, Jesus. And I pray that your kingdom would come in our hearts and our lives and that your will will be done. In the precious name of Jesus, somebody said amen. Be on the lookout for the next series, guys. And hey, if this blessed you and encouraged you, why don't you right now leave a like on the video, comment on the video, and share this with one of the biggest hypocrites in your life, right? <laughs> and uh, man, I believe that they will be blessed as well. It's your boy, Rodney. Till the next time, y'all.